Hey everyone, and welcome to this week's OSHIP. We discuss a really broad range of subjects on OSHIP from leadership and entrepreneurship stories to new trends in technology, or even marketing that impacts human behavior and subsequently the potential business impact. Today, I want to lean in an area of, in of communication that we've all experienced, but don't actually spend a lot of time thinking about, even though it can actually have a really profound impact on our overall experience and correlating impressions of a business critical customer communications. Mia Papanikolaou is the former chief operating officer of Strata and the GM of North and South America for Aspire. Both firms focused on helping customer management with a strong focus on enhancing customer communication at all of the key customer touch points. Liz Steffen was the VP of customer engagement at Striata, which is actually where she met Mia. She also happens to have a master's degree in education psychology, which gives her a really fascinating perspective on how people learn and retain knowledge. So Liz and me are actually customer communication strategists and consultants. They actually work with me at Camilla Collective and they have a really unique expertise that honestly is very frequently overlooked and misunderstood. And so when it works great, it's like magic and it can actually yield incredible business results. But when it's done wrong, it can actually turn into kind of a bit of a disaster and create some pretty spectacular ownership moments, which is why I thought they'd be perfect guests for today's episode. And with that, let's get going with this week's episode. I've titled The Good and the Bad of Customer Communications. Let's go. Liz, Mia, great to have you on the show. How are you? Very good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's fun. You know, obviously I get to work with you at Camillion Collector, but and I see you doing your own show, which we're going to give a nod to later, but it's fun to have our shows collide. So a meeting of the minds. I've done chief digital officer roles, as you know, in many parts of my career. And I've always found what the two of you do really fascinating. So I think it's going to be fun to be able to tap into that today. But I think a great place to start would be making sure that our audience understands what we're talking about. So can you talk a little bit about what critical customer communications actually is? Yeah. So when you think about customer communications, we're talking about those communications that happen after someone's become a customer. So not marketing communications, sort of pre-acquisition, not loyalty communications, rather those driven, sort of triggered, transactional, what we formerly sort of really focused on as transactional, those communications like bills and statements and policies and, oh, you're, you know, here's a notification that your rate is going to increase this year. Or, hey, your bill is past due. This is a collections notice. All of those types of communications that aren't really cool and fun, but are necessary And every single person watching today receives, right? They receive that as part of doing business with a particular brand. Yeah. So I can add that everyone is waiting on these communications. You know, payment confirmation coming to it. If you don't receive your payment confirmation, you think something's gone wrong. So everyone is receiving these. Everyone knows and is expecting them. And they're just not leveraged at all. And they have a very bad customer experience. You know, it's funny putting my marketing guy hat on for a minute. It's like, you see all this time that gets pained over newsletters and campaign messages and so on. But the thing that actually is happening all the time, these kind of more transactional messages, which are, to be clear, actually have value to the customer. Yeah. I'm sure as much as they want to hear about whatever nonsense I want, I might send them as a marketer that day. You know, these are things that like have real value. And I feel like a lot of times they're just really glazed over like you know the, these touch points for people that's exactly right freddie like we we call it the set it and forget it syndrome mm. you know these communications are often set up sort of at the beginning of the company or the beginning of the product right and they're forgotten because no one ever really reflects back on hey we should really take a look and see if these messages are on brand or what we're actually saying or hey you know people read things differently now on mobile devices and the way they consume content is different now no one really ever looks to these types of communications right they don't focus the attention on it they're just sort of the stepchild in the group of communications and often drive pretty bad experiences 
Why do you think they're so important? They are so important because the communications that you have to send, usually regulated, it's not a matter of, oh, we've chosen not to send it. You have to send a bill. You have to send a statement. And as a consumer, you're waiting for these communications. So, you know, these are the communications consumers are waiting for. They're opening and they have the worst possible experience. So this is a massive fracture in terms of communication within every company. This is an opportunity to leverage because you have that captive audience and very few brands out there actually do. <laughs> so it's like a wasted opportunity because these types of communications have very high open rate. So when we think about if they're printed, right, everyone's opening up their bills if they receive them in the mail. And if they're digital, right, we see open rates in excess of 65, 70, 80 percent, right? Put your marketing hat on for a second. If you got those high open rates for a particular campaign, you would be thrilled. Yeah. Always getting these regularly on a monthly basis. But these are not the things that spam filters filter out because it's not marketing, right? It's essentially, yeah. but it, it's a, a missed opportunity. I have to ask, and I mean this as a compliment. I mean, it's a compliment. This is not like the sexiest thing on earth. Value is so incredibly obvious when you actually take the time to think about it. And I don't think enough people think about it. And you've both been doing this a long time now. Do you love it? Like, is this something that like this, like does it for you guys? You're like, yeah, I think I'm Yeah. I'm personally very passionate about it. And I never thought I would be. I come from an email marketing background. I then fell into this space. And was appalled, truly appalled at the communications they had done. It's like, why aren't we applying the principles that we were applying in email marketing to these communications? What makes this different? You know, just because it's regulated doesn't mean it needs to be ugly and not have a good customer experience. So yeah, very passionate about improving customer experience because we're all consumers. And you know, I knew these communications and I'm appalled every single time I receive it. Never you, Liz, do you share the fire? Totally. Passion is contagious. You know, I started working with Mia a decade ago and her passion really motivated me to become very passionate. So you mentioned before I have sort of an educational psychology background. That's what I did. I had a whole entire other career <laughs> prior to doing this. And when I transitioned into the customer communication space, it was an easy transition in that it was all about the psychology of consumers. Like what do consumers want to see? I'm a consumer, right? I know what I want. What do others want? What motivates them? What enables them to click through, right? All of these types of things that traditionally have been viewed like from a marketing perspective, they're also very important in, hey, how do we maintain our customers? How do we keep them happy? How do we drive really relevant experiences through these often considered boring and like you said, not sexy types of communications. And so, yeah, it's opened up a whole new world, my view, and one that Mia and I, we love talking about. Yes. As I was preparing for today's show, obviously going back through all your guys' backgrounds, and I had always connected mentally this idea that you had this psychology education, but it was interesting is that it was actually this educational psychology, which I didn't really understand what it was in all honesty. And I, I had to get out there and Google it. And I thought it was so interesting. It was around this concept of like how people learn, and how people retain knowledge. And I feel like a lot of these kind of customer messaging that you're talking about, you're trying to drive certain behaviors out of people. And I just thought that must play such an interesting role in how you look at things. So I doubt you dreamt this is where you were going to use it later yeah. in your life, but I think it's such a cool background to have. Yes, indeed. This was definitely not on my vision board 20 yeah. years <laughs> <laughs> I may have to ask what was on the vision board later, but that might be a whole other episode. So why are companies struggling with this? Where does this go wrong for folks? They are home ratchets within the company itself, and that's why they struggle with it. So there's silos within the companies. It's usually line of business space. So these communications sit within a line of business that doesn't touch marketing. These are critical communications. They usually use different systems entirely. There's thousands of templates. So fixing them is almost a monstrous job that no one wants to tackle. There are so many fractures within the company themselves that the fractures actually seep out to the consumer. I can speak from this from personal experience again, if I won't name a specific brand, but I can think of a role where I was in as a chief digital officer and we had implemented a huge new top of the line you know, Salesforce marketing cloud implementation. And we'd thought through the many marketing initiatives we want to do and how we wanted to 
react to people's behavior in certain ways to trigger certain things in e-commerce and so on. But we'd basically forgotten about the hundreds of probably transactional emails that we needed to do. And I always think of that when I, you know, especially when I first met uh, both of you, I was like, what a missed opportunity. Tell me more about some of the other areas where people get challenged thinking through these kind of strategies. Yeah. So we have a, quite a few, but I think if we just focus on a sort of a practical example, right, of what Mio was saying, the siloed nature of these types of communication, we can give you like a really good example of how that translates into a bad customer experience. And Mia, this is actually sort of a story that you experienced. Yeah. With very big brand. And we are going to mention brands here today. And I think it's valuable to mention them because some of these brands are really awesome and they do great things from a digital transformation perspective. Like they have overhauled their customer experience in, in great ways, yet they still struggle with these critical customer communications. Yeah. The biggest struggle comes in with data using the data incorrectly, not reading the data correctly, and not understanding the consumer. I had insurance through a particular company and they had life cycle communication set up and I had actually opted for all digital communications. And a week after my birthday, I received a birthday card from the company saying happy birthday. And it's time for you to look at certain products that are age appropriate and it made me feel old. And <laughs> you're like, well, nice, thank you. <laughs> so it, it wasn't so much a happy birthday message. It was a, you're getting old message. And yeah, I cool. actually took offense because you're not thinking about the psychology of the customer. I don't have these products with you. So why That's are you fascinating? It's like, it makes sense. You think, oh, birthday message, cool date, whatever the psychology of the customer, the right. feelings. Yeah. I remember opening it and actually calling Liz and saying, I'm so offended. I am <laughs> so offended. I know I'm getting old, but I don't need a company to tell me that. I'd love to just quickly add that. One of the things that for any of you who may be listening or watching their ship right now, there's this concept of called customer journey mapping that you may or may not be familiar with. And a lot of this is around this idea, and I'm going to do my best to justify this through my, explain this through my own lens, is you think about all the touch points that, that people have as they go through their interaction with you as a business, where they're considering before they might start interact with you down to what happens more, you know, about post-transaction when they're a customer and how do people start to interact with you at each of these steps? And what's interesting about this concept is it's not just saying, hey, yes, here's all the touch points, which as I say, I think something that a lot of people feel like they can go through that mental exercise on their own, but saying, okay, at that moment, what are they thinking about? What are they feeling? What are the things that make them nervous at that moment? What do they really want? What's motivating them? And really thinking about each of these little things, you start to realize, man, like the play that I was making three steps ago isn't the right play anymore. And then you start taking in the context of that same thing applies. Not all customers are the same. So if you're a customer, I'm riffing here to make a point, but you know, the way a single mother in, you know, a certain part of the world or region of the U S versus a business user or something is going to be really different. And so you can find that you've got lots and lots of these different journeys you have to do. And you can't just do this one size fits all. And a lot of people do, and I'm sure it leads to a lot of really messy situations. But a lot, mm. Yes, that's, there are a lot of messy situations with that, Freddie. You hit the nail on the head. You know, customer journeys aren't linear, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. There are a lot of different ways that journey will go. And I think a great example is major top five bank. You know, Mia had a business account there and also had a personal account. And... Oh. Unfortunately, right, Mia, the bank only viewed Mia as a business user. <laughs> well, well, I decided to merge my data I, when I didn't ask them to. I was running the business, but it wasn't my business. The last thing I wanted was for these two accounts to be merged. So another example of using data incorrectly. I understand you want to get rid of sinos, but you still need to be asking the customer if this is okay. I had to go and spend time to call the bank and say, separate these accounts. So it really comes down to how are you using the data and how are you making decisions for your customer? And I think the impact, right, of that bad example really needs to resonate with everyone watching because the impact was Mia now had to take time out of her very valuable day, right, yeah. to fix the scenario that she never wanted to happen in the first place. And so that's where critical communications, these customer communications, that's where everyone needs to understand, like, 
these can break your relationship, right? Mm. People can literally decide, you know what? I'm so frustrated with you because you don't know who I am. You just can't get my preferences right. Mm -hmm. These communications are important to me. So I'm going to go ahead and move to your competitor. And we see it time and time and happen. Yeah, I've been kind of giggling to myself as I've been listening to you talk about some of the examples, which is sometimes when we talk to people in a ship, they are sharing things that they've seen in the industry or industry trends and how it's impacting them. It's amusing to me that, you know, some of these things are really direct examples that are happening to you guys. You know, at some point today, I was planning on asking you, you know, what your kind of oh ship stories in your careers oh. are. You know, I think some of these examples, they're oh ship moments, I think that you've experienced through your interactions, either as a customer or uh, someone interacting with a brand that you work with. Are there any examples where you've seen people struggle, where it's been something you've worked with directly, even if you can't name the brand directly, you know, out of respect to them for confidentiality reasons? I can bring up an example with a brand who sure. worked with directly and happened to be a customer of. So again, I'm going to bring the personal experience. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it was a business relationship and we had a business insurance policy with this customer of ours, it was a, a large insurer. And weirdly, they were our customer on the one side, all digital and on the other side, not the side that I was a customer. They received a piece of paper rather than digital, which I wanted to say it needed to pay the bill. So I was like, that's great. I'll pay the bill on the actual bill itself. It said, go online. Awesome. I will do that. So I go online It gave me the URL. And nowhere on the page was there pay my bill button. And I clicked through all the navigation and I couldn't find the pay my bill. And I had to actually put it into the search. And it was something like the fifth answer down was where I could pay my bill. And it's like, why would you put that onto the bill when there's no easy way to pay when I get there? And it's like, that's such a bad user experience in every single way. So we were, because they were a client, took it back to them and said, this was the experience. These were the steps I had to go through. And we could literally see all of them just thinking under the table. But it's a real, I mean, the friction they are creating from the cell. Yeah. Yeah. Things like this also, like it drives the impact to customer service. I mean, like there's real cost that gets associated to this. This is a thing I think that, again, I talked about earlier, like how I think so much is forgotten, but this is a great example of like, you know, that there's all these business impacts just to that one misstep. Yes. I mean, imagine Freddie, Mia was trying to pay them money. <laughs> like, help us help you get your money, you know? It sounds so like, duh, hello, but people miss this time and time again. They make that payment experience extremely difficult and challenging for people. I just want to double check that with that company and that you mentioned one earlier about the misstep with the birthday, those guys weren't sharing data, right? I just want to make sure they didn't send you online and then they assumed you were too old to do online. So they wanted to send you a paper bill. No, no connection. You're like, mm, wow. it, feels like it feels like an offline check it's, for a second. Like it's personal. Yeah. You, you emailed it uh, from your AOL account, your Prodigy account, one or two <laughs> times, and it sent off some, some signals. <laughs> uh, I still, my wife has an AOL account, and I still razzer about it. So. That is hilarious. I mean, I have a Hotmail, so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's not quite there. That's really funny. Give me some more examples. What yeah. Else? So they're not all bad though. So when we're talking about sort of issues with data, right, there are companies who are getting this right. So I'll give you an example. It was my personal experience with my mortgage servicer. At the time, it was Penny Mac, right? They're constantly selling your mortgage off. So, you know, it changes all the time. But at this particular moment in time, it was Penny Mac and they sent me my mortgage statement. Right. So knowing how much I'm going to pay or what's going to be auto drafted for my account. And in there, they took an opportunity to upsell me and they did it in an ingenious way because they used data that they had on hand. They know my property address. They know how much I owe on the mortgage and they know how much the estimated value of my home was. So they sent me a message. Hey, now's a great time. Right. This was during the pandemic. Rates were very low. This is a great time to refinance and take any cash out of your mortgage if you'd like, or we have HELOC options, home equity lines of credit. And that triggered immediately for my husband and I to ask, hey, inquire about this. So we started the refinance process and that was a direct result of leveraging that critical communication, my statement, and embedding it with hyper-personalized upsell targeted messaging. 
right? And there you go. That's a way to increase the share of wallet. So again, these critical communications, if you leverage their power, they can help you bring top line revenue as well as help you cut costs. So we've talked about how these kind of messages, their core messages, there's no opt out on them. You want to respect that, right? You don't want to overload it to the point that people are like, now you're kind of like putting jamming a ton of stuff in here where you feel like this is marketing. It isn't, you know, emails that are at my core. First, I'm sure you have clients or brands you work with that maybe try and push the limits of that in a little bit of a cheeky way. Like what is the appropriate level of maximizing the value of these without getting to the place where it feels abused? Does that make sense? It does make sense. And I yeah. think the appropriate balance comes into what makes sense for the customer? Is this going to be an advantage for the customer? So the example that Liz brought up, it was actually advantageous to her. Mm. Even though it was an upsell or a cross-sell, it was advantageous to Liz. And I had an example. I used to live in London and I had a, the broadband provider that I would pay every single month. And a week after I'd pay, they'd send me marketing saying, if you refer a friend, you can save 50 pounds. Like, well, you know, had you put that into my bill, I would have paid attention because at that moment I'm swapping from bull truck and I don't want to be paying that bill. Yeah. And if I pay 50 pounds, I would have. That's an advantage to me at that point. A week later, when it has nothing to do with my bill and they're telling me about 50 pounds off and saying, oh, this is for your benefit. I don't care. So I never took it up. So always look at, is this of a benefit at this point to the consumer then out of it? Yeah. It goes back to being customer centric. Right. And unfortunately, too many of these teams, again, because they're so siloed, right? Sort of marketing is doing their thing, operations, you know, IT, all these different groups. So everyone's doing their own thing. And these critical communications sort of reside between operations, you know, lines of business, sort of weird places in the organization. And hey, wouldn't using the bill be a great opportunity to put this marketing message? No one ever talks about those things. And again, it's just a big mix. Yeah. I want to jump back to something I was mentioning earlier. I was talking a little bit about how my own personal experiences that I implemented new technologies where I had to start thinking about this, but I think it's an inverse of that as well. So some of the companies I've had the pleasure of working with, and maybe when we're talking about legacy tech, not always a pleasure, uh, but some of the you know, larger organizations I've worked with, they have a lot of accumulated tech. They're dealing with some systems that can be not just old, but just massive, where they've just accumulated so much depth because they've just been bolting onto and bolting onto and bolting onto it for you know, many years, sometimes even decades. How does that impact? Is that something that I'm sure that runs into being a problem for you guys? Like, who do you want that? That's a massive problem. And we see it constantly, particularly, and I hate to bring up insurance again, but they suffer the most from this. They've gone through massive consolidation where they're acquiring companies. They're merging, and so they're actually acquiring old technology and bolting onto old technology that they have and changing it is not simple. That lift, it's not just a, you know, talk about a lift and shift. It's not that simple. It takes years and years and planning. And so, you know, trying to get this right means understanding what needs to be done and doing it. But I think the monstrosity of the project usually makes people back off. Yeah. And what we see is, the way the consumer experience is affected is you could literally have two different products from the same company that their communications look entirely different. They're branded differently. The way you're addressed is different, right? I could be called Liz in one, Elizabeth another, and one, I don't even have a name. I just have a policy number. <laughs> it's all coming from the same brand. And consumers notice these things right? You think about it. It's like, wow, I have my home insurance and my auto insurance with you. And you guys don't even know who I am. That's extremely frustrating. And then the other big area where we see sort of this affects the customer experience is that when you have all this legacy tech, all these different systems, you have thousands and thousands of templates. And so templates are like, you know, the form in the background that sort of dictates what every communication looks like. And most of these communications have a document attached to them. So that template is really, really critical. And when, let's say, an you know, large carrier buys five other small carriers, they go from 100 templates to 1,000 templates. How do you manage changes across those? Right? 
And you think again about insurance, there's a lot of regulatory changes that happen on a very rapid basis, right? When the commission says, hey, these rates have to increase, now you have to look across a thousand templates to get those changes made. So what happens is consumers now receive, again, another fractured experience because some templates are updated, some templates are not updated, and everything looks and feels different. And we've seen this happen time and time again. And financial services, biggest culprit when it comes to legacy tech hindering their experience. And yeah, I know, again, another top five bank, you had a great bad example of how this affected your experience. Yesterday, actually. <laughs> Nothing <laughs> like timely examples. Nothing like timely. You know what? They daily, pretty. So look, if you're really into this stuff, you just must have seen stuff all the time. You're like, why are they so bad? <laughs> Can I tell you a quick small tangent, by the way? I have to yeah. borrow to my personalization. I'm going to admit a secret. I don't think I've ever admitted on camera before. <laughs> so for years, and I know this is more on the marketing side, obviously no one likes getting spam. And so whenever I would met, register for anything that I didn't really want to register for, but they made me register for, I've always been registering, not only have like a spam email account, but I always register the same name. And that's Mr. Sassy Pants. And so I get messages for like Mr. Sassy or hi, Sassy, or like Mr. Sassy. Pant. And then I can tell when people have been selling my data, because I'll get messages from random companies that were interviewed like, hey, Sassy, take advantage of this offer. And I was like, oh, God. So I have like a whole like spam identity that I use so that I really see when people are doing this badly. Anyway, I digress. Let's go back to something a little more serious. <laughs> Well, they, they're all just as bad, really. I actually did a wire transfer yesterday. And as soon as I completed the wire transfer, got an email in a template from the bank saying, you've just initiated this wire transfer. Great. About an hour later, get a text-based email saying, we've started this wire transfer with all the details. So it was so difficult to read. And it's obviously system generated. And but then you think that you like did a second one get sent? Well, it's also an hour later. That would freak me out. What? You don't Why? mess with wire transfer notifications. Exactly. Just a pretty low tolerance for those communications go wrong. Why do they look so different? Why are you giving me two? What is going on? I have actually done many wire transfers and so I'm used to the two, but every single time it happens and they look so different, I still get that little shock, that jolt. Why? Yeah, you know, a huge chunk, I think, of what we're talking about as it sounds so obvious when you say it, but I don't think all of us tee into it. It's like, be customer centric. Think about yeah. the needs of your customer. If it's a good experience for them, it's going to be a good experience for your business. And, you know, these things aren't about reach. It's about making people respect and appreciate your business. There's a friend of mine many years ago was always talking about that he was in the business of making loved brands. And that when he built Loved Brand, not because it was cool or funny or something like that, but because every interaction with that brand experience made the customers fiercely loyal to them. And all of these little messages, they matter, they count. And I don't think people take that into account enough. I want to be conscious of time of today's episode. There's a couple other things I really wanted to kind of make sure I addressed with you. Let's talk a little bit about the dream. I'm going to count these as those ship stories, by the way. I think you... <laughs> Yeah. Look like Definitely. as you see it along the way, but what does what great look like? What, you know, what's the kind of utopia of customer communication, if you will? So Mia, start and then you can add to it because um, Mia and I, we're sort of one amazing brain when we each share our opinions. So from my perspective, it's where the company really knows who I am and knows what I need and knows how to make my life easier, right? So it's all about, for me, convenience. So think about all the bill ready notifications that you receive now. All they say is like, your statement is online or your bill is ready to be viewed. And they don't tell me anything else. But Amex will say, hey, your bill is this amount. Here's what you have due. Would you like to pay it now? And if you wanna see details, now you can go see it online or in the app, right? That makes my life easier. Amex knows who I am. They tell me exactly what I need to know. They make it super simple for me to pay my bill. Those are the types of experiences that we should be seeing across the board, where really you're allowing me to save time on the things that I don't really want to spend a lot of time on. Yeah. And if I can add on saving time, 
every communication that any company puts together, you've got to consider whether you're saving the customer time or you're asking them to spend time. And both have value. But asking them to spend time on something that they shouldn't be spending time on is a terrible customer experience. So sending a notification, like I said, saying your bill is ready, is asking a customer to spend time. When what we should be doing is saving them time. This is how much you owe. This is how you can pay. Saving you time. Perfect. Where I need to spend time is on something that I don't necessarily understand. And I don't want to spend time in frustration and make it easy for me. And that comes in, let's say I want to file a claim. I don't really understand how to do that. Make it easy with steps in layman's terms that I understand. And so I'm spending time in a manner that is to my advantage. Don't make it frustrating for me to spend time on it. So it's really looking at every single communication and saying, do we need to save the customer time or do we need to help them spend time? A lot of what you think you were talking about is friction, which is a concept I've been obsessed with lately. And I find myself talking about more and more and more. And the extension of I think what we've been talking about today, and is for anyone again, listening or watching their share, is you've got to nail the communication part that drives interaction. But when you actually get to said interaction, you got to work really close with your product teams to make sure that the experiences are just as frictionless. And so whether that is making sure that we, the communication matches the action to take as many steps as possible. And one thing we didn't talk a lot about today is like making sure that the same communication that you guys might be sending, because I think a lot about what we were talking about was things that are sent to people. But then when people get into the experience that that is really consistent, the instructions are the same, the messaging are the same, things are really intuitive because actually you can send have the best customer communications on earth, but if you're launching people into a wall afterwards, it doesn't do you any good. <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly that, Freddie. We're actually working with a client right now where we're giving them a lot of recommendations on how they can improve the communications, but all of the communications drive the customers to the portal. And when we get to the portal, it's like, Friction, 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 friction everywhere, right? Yeah, yeah. So exactly that. One of our recommendations is like, hey, your portal needs an assessment. It needs a complete revamp because that's just as frustrating as the communication they're receiving right now. So yes, you're right. They go hand in hand. And I think the utopia is a true omni-channel experience where the communications you're receiving and then the actions you're taking and any communications that you're applying with, all that's done in a seamless fashion where the brand has a single view of who you are. You have all these multiple preferences that you can control, right? And everything is seamless. There's no friction in that process. That's the utopia. That's utopia. Mm -hmm. And so for anyone tuning in today, if you had to kind of make sure they took one thing away from covered a lot of really different subjects, a very different kind of ship, and I really enjoyed it and I hope our audience has as well. But if you wanted people to take away kind of one thing from today, Mia, why don't we start with you? What would that thing be? Uh, said it and forget it shouldn't exist. The forget it part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> said it. A lot of people aren't even getting to that step, yeah. but you want to no, yeah. forget it. It should yeah. be regular audits and communication, be customer centric, and making sure that the experience is seamless on these communications as it is on everything else. Love that. Totally agree. Liz, what's your take? Data, data, data. Yeah. <laughs> it's your data because it all starts there. And if you can get the data piece right, then everything else becomes a whole lot easier. Great advice. So I want to make sure that people are able to follow up with you. So after today's show, if they want to find out more about you, what's the best way to either get in contact or learn more about you? Check us out on LinkedIn. And every Friday, we host a show called Coffee Chats and Communications. So be sure to tune in. It's cute, it's short, it's five minutes, and we give you really great tips on how you can improve your customer communications and the overall customer experience. For the record, I'm a fan. That's why I want, had to have you guys on our ship. So oh. it really is great content and you were as wonderful as I expected you'd be today. So I thank you again for that. And then LinkedIn, they could also a good place to follow just in general, individually. Okay, great. So I'd like to take a moment just to thank you know, everyone who's tuned in today. Again, whether you're watching on some of our video channels, or your primary platform of YouTube, or you are watching on LinkedIn or Facebook, or you're listening on an audio podcast like Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We really appreciate your time and your 
being a part of our community. So if you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe. You can do that by clicking on the QR code above or go to oshipshow.com and you can see all the different places we stream. Hell, you might be a video watcher today, but you may prefer podcasts. And if you do, just go to shipshow.com and we've got links to all the primary places we stream. So again, you know, the best thing you can do to support us is give this video a like, add a comment, share it on your feed. All of that helps make OSHIP possible and it allows us to keep bringing on great guests like Liz and Mia. Liz, Mia, thank you again for your time. Any final words? Here's to making some awesome critical customer communications. That's me. I'll <laughs> take you. it. Take, take care, everyone. We'll see you next week on our ship. Thank you.